Good evening and welcome to Avenues to Wholeness Life Coaching. My name is Reverend LaThelma Yimbata, and I have the distinct honor of serving as the Associate Executive Director of American Baptist Women's Ministries. American Baptist Women's Ministries is a Christ-centered ministry with a commitment to encourage and empower women and girls to serve God. ABWM is a diverse community of American Baptist women and girls serving in ministry in Christ's name in the U.S., including Puerto Rico, as well as internationally. With local, area, region, state, and national levels of ministry, American Baptist Women's Ministry strives to create and sustain communities of passionately faithful, mission-minded women and girls engaged in worship, service, and friendship. Our ministries include domestic violence and human trafficking prevention and education, building beloved community, and developing leaders. This is the second webinar of a season of webinars happening every two weeks until November 14th, covering topics from financial wellness to mission to overcoming addiction. You can register and find out more about our upcoming webinars by visiting our website at www.abwomensministries.org slash webinars. Here are some guidelines for your time with us on this webinar. You'll be muted throughout the presentation. However, you may, you may use your raise hand icon during question and answer to be unmuted and to ask a question, or you may type your question into the question box in, in your control panel. If you see a question written that is close to your question or is your question, you can upvote to emphasize another person's question and we will address that question first. We'll be taking polls throughout the presentation and hope to have your full attention and full participation. Lastly, but certainly not least, please make sure to complete the survey provided at the end of this webinar so that we can continue providing you with outstanding webinars. I would like to introduce our esteemed panelists for tonight, presenter for tonight. We have Elaine Cody, owner of Cody Clarity and Coaching. She's a life coach who believes that desired outcomes should inform the choices we make to reach our goals. She is certified in a powerful technique for helping you get clear on what it is you want and overcoming the obstacles to getting there. Clarity, momentum, thinking. She is a life coach who helps women become confident in decision-making, affecting their lives, businesses, and ministries. Elaine believes that double-mindedness is the enemy of peace and therefore a threat to mental and spiritual wholeness. Through coaching, women can become crystal clear on what they want and what they must do to get there. Elaine is a certified spiritual gifts trainer through Place, Place Ministries, a certified retirement options coach, and writer of numerous workshops on finding your purpose and identifying your gifts and talents. In addition, she has a certificate in theology and ministry. She and her husband of 44 years have two adult sons. In her spare time, Elaine likes to read, craft, paint, and make greeting cards. Without further ado, I will turn it over to Elaine. Thank you so much, Elaine. You're welcome. Thank you for that uh, fabulous uh, bio. And good evening to all of you who've tuned in. And so we will dig right in because we have a rather rigorous uh, series of things that I would like to accomplish tonight. Uh, the one thing that I would like to add to my intro is why did I become a coach? Because I am rather passionate about it. I'm as passionate about coaching as I am about teaching Bible study, which I've done for 25 years. By the time I became a coach, I didn't realize I really was always coaching with people. I was always asking them questions because my goal was to make sure that the people that I met and I spoke to move forward in their thinking, especially if they showed some signs of being stuck. It became my personal mission to help them take the next step to get closer to what they wanted to do. And when I spoke to uh, a woman at that time, I lived in Minnesota, who was a coach, and I said to her, it, it's this thing, it's this thing I like to do. And she said, it's called coaching. I had no idea it had a name or that it could be a profession, but I was all in. And so that has been my passion. And the thing that I would really like to know right now is, are any of you out there life coaches or even business coaches? Oh, 
no fellow coaches in the house. We have one, actually. Oh, one, okay. Two now. Good. I'm going to show up out in the cold now. It looks like we have two answered yes. A majority of us are here to learn. <laughs> wow. Awesome. That is awesome. Okay, so let's start at the top. The top is, what is coaching? Uh, coaching, and I'm going to read a definition. That's the last time I'm going to read anything to you. Uh, there is a credentialing organization called the International Coach Federation, and the definition of coaching is, it's a partnering with clients in a thought-provoking and creative process that inspires them to maximize their personal and professional potential. So it is a process where the coach is the expert in the coaching process and the agenda is set forth by the client. And for we who are Christian women, another question that is really important is, is coaching biblical? I can call two scriptures, but there really are several others. Uh, Proverbs 27, 17 says, as iron sharpens iron, so one man or woman sharpens another. And the second scripture is Ephesians 4, 12 to 13. To equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. So I was trained very specifically at an organization that had a Christian track because many of my clients have been Christian and their biblical worldview view fuels everything that they do and the way they think and see things. And so those are just two, yes, yes, and yes, coaching is biblical. So have any of you experienced life or business coaching? Looks like we have some people who've experienced, just a few people who've experienced coaching. Okay, okay. That's really good. That's just a curiosity question. Actually, there are as many uh, categories of coaching as um, there are coaches. There are health coaches, relationship coaches, success coaches, etc. And if you go out on the internet and just plug in coaching, you'll have a very good idea of how many uh, types of coaches there are. Because I have function as a business coach as well as a life coach. So here is the first question, and I'm going to share a slide with you. How is coaching different than other forms of spiritual companionship? Okay. All right, I hope that you're all able to see that. And if you're not, please uh, let Reverend Thelma know. Okay, first thing from the top. The term spiritual companionship is something that is used in the community of, of caregivers of different sorts, and it seems to cover all of the bases. I've color-coded each of the rows so that we can go across one category, and when we change colors, we are also changing to um, a different modality or practice. The first one is pastoral counseling, and pastoral counseling or therapy I'm not equating them, but pastoral counseling and therapy, in both cases, the agenda is set by the counselee or the person who comes. And the process is really about problem solving, about crisis management, and about healing of past wounds. And of course, when you're in a pastoral care situation, there may be many other spiritual things that are at work. All right, the role of the helper is as facilitator. And then the desired outcome is mental, emotional, or spiritual health, or all three, hopefully. All right, let's look now at mentoring. So in mentoring, the agenda is chosen by the mentor and the mentee 
and it may be influenced by systems. And by that, I mean, you may be in a new job, you may be in a new educational uh, situation, and the process is about development. Now, how many of you remember being in that new job, you're a new kid on the block, hey, you may be manager, you may even be boss, but you're still a new person on the block. So what do you think is the most difficult part of a new job? A new culture, new relationships, or your new responsibilities? So how do the numbers look? We're still polling um, when, we, when we complete. We'll give it another few minutes. All right. It looks like we're done. All right. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Most people said new responsibilities. Yes, I don't find that surprising. And within the context of that, you've got all the new relationships and all those things function within the context of a culture. So those are, those are really uh, realistic numbers that really kind of show you what a new job is like. So the role of the helper, who is the mentor, is that they are the expert where the mentee uh, needs instruction. And you just pray on a new job that you have someone who has some clout and some seniority who comes to mentor you because knowing what to do and when to do and who the players are is a very massive job when you start. Uh, and the, the desired outcome is that you improve in being aligned with the system, especially if you come from another job where they did things a certain way and now you haven't changed fields, but you've yet perhaps signed on with their competitor, but they have their own way of doing business. Uh, during the time frame in which I was a, 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 a business coach, I was asked to use my skills to take first time new managers to the next level on Friday, uh, many of them had MBAs. They were in the pool of people for promotion to the professional levels of management. And on Monday, they were promoted and they were now the head of the pool. And they were required to respond as managers from day one. So I was brought in to come alongside them to help them with that task, which was massive. And uh, it just shows you how difficult it is to get adjusted when you're trying to do your work at the same time. Okay, let's move on to discipling. Discipling is really a very, it's not necessarily a Christian thing, but uh, in this context, I've treated it as a Christian thing. So the agenda is set by the discipler. And if, once again, if you are blessed enough to have um, an older believer or saint in your midst who takes you under their wing, just love on them uh, because their process is instruction. That's what they do. They are the teacher for you and they have one desired outcome for you, which is totally scriptural, which is that you become spiritually mature. All right. Now we go to spiritual direction. And in spiritual direction, the agenda is set by the Holy Spirit. The process is discerning or discernment and praying. This is by the uh, director. The role of the helper, who is your spiritual director, is as prayer, as a listener, and as a discerner. And their desired outcome is for you to go deeper with God and perhaps you come for confirmation that uh, you are indeed in God's will, or you may be coming to discover God's will. So a spiritual director really is a prayer warrior first and foremost. All right, and last but not least, because this was added, uh, life coaching um, came about during the 1940s, as I remember the history correctly. Uh, life coaching 
is the agenda is set by the coachee. This is so totally different where when you come into a situation uh, that someone asks you, so what do you want to do? Because when you're in front of a consultant, they will ask you about what you want to do and then they'll proceed to make up a package for you and give it to you and tell you what to do. Okay, the process is done by powerful questioning and active listening because the role of the life coach is uh, to be an expert in the coaching process and a partner with the coachee. So the desired outcome, because the uh, agenda was set by the coachee, is to move toward the coachee's goal. And so you can see that there are some major differences between those things. And there are, uh, there are many mix-ups in the marketplace today, so I really wanted to make sure that you saw that. Okay, so um, what I'd like to do is ask, has anyone experienced spiritual direction? I have had spiritual direction. Do we have some? We do. I'll show you. Oh, sorry. Wow. Okay. Okay. That is really fabulous. Now, I'd just like to say for, for the, some of you who uh, haven't experienced this, you may have heard the term spiritual direction and didn't know what it was. It was considered a mystical practice that was practiced by uh, uh, members of the Catholic Church, and mostly members of the clergy. It really wasn't open to um, anyone who wasn't a priest. I don't believe that even the nuns were um, allowed to participate. But then, as because we're not separate Christians, we're the body of Christ, there were some denominations um, and some of um, our ministers, meaning Protestant ministers, began to take advantage of spiritual direction, saw the immediate benefit of having that in their lives because they were and are the, the captains, as it were, or the under shepherds to a body of people. So they really need to know what direction they're going in. And, and so now spiritual direction is pretty much known in the culture and uh, anyone at any time can seek out a spiritual director. Okay, what I'd like to do is, um, I would like to do some live coaching with Reverend LaFelma uh, around a question that might be on her mind so that you can see how the process works. And we'll spend about 10, maybe 15 minutes on that. And then I'll debrief that so that you can see uh, some of the elements of coaching that are present when we're in a session. Okay, so how are you today, Reverend LaFelma? I'm doing well. A little tired, but I'm here. I'm excited to be here. <laughs> that is good. And so uh, do you have something on your mind that you'd like to coach around? Sure. I would like to coach around um, motherhood. Um, and transitioning as a new professional, as well as um, a new mother. And just been, I've been dealing with a lot of guilt around working and traveling with a seven month old daughter um, and wanting to be seen as professional, but also want to um, nurture and love on my daughter. So I feel like personally, what I think is going on is that I feel like I am a very, um, what I consider a woke woman. I, I have walked in my uh, spiritual gifts and my calling, but um, sometimes in my family system, I feel like I kind of restrict myself to certain gender roles and I'm very hard on myself. One is like not always being the person that's cooking and always being the person that's caring for my, my daughter. So just Wanted to work through that. I don't really know what my question is, but I feel like this season of transition has been challenging for me emotionally yes. and in all areas. <laughs> yes, yes. Okay, so my first comment is this, uh, and I speak from experience. You're not alone. 
uh, it, it is a pretty normal situation and that may not make you feel any better, but it is good to know that you are not alone because whenever you hold your baby, you don't want to leave your baby. And that's how that goes. Now, let me ask you this. If you had your druthers, if you had other choices, are there other uh, situations or other ways of handling this situation that you would have taken? Handling motherhood or? Uh, no, handling, handling the, the piece about having to leave your child. Okay, you all, I will um, reflect back what I heard from you, okay. which is there is a tremendous amount of guilt associated with answering the call that's on your life yeah. at this time. And so what I'd like to know is, uh, are there other scenarios? Are there other, uh, are there other ways that you could have answered this call while you have the baby at this time? Um, it doesn't seem like it. I think that I am a person that's very much so attuned and who listens to the spirit when the spirit yes. speaks. Yeah. And I felt very confident that yes. this is what I was supposed to be doing in this season. Yes. Um, and I and I know much of my life as a young woman, as a woman in general, is to negotiate and to navigate because I, I know that a, a lot of my challenge is outside of me as well because we don't live in a society and a culture that um, is welcoming and, and affirming towards women, especially women who have children and in all these different complexities. I don't think we live in that kind of society. Um, so I'm constantly trying to, within my family, create a world that I want my daughter to live in. So I know these challenges are outside of myself. And, but to answer your question, I, I, don't, I don't think so. I, I felt like if I did not step out now, I don't know if I, I would later. So I think it's that fear too, that um, if I restrict myself now, then I, I will be upset with myself and have some resentment. And yes. I want that. Yes. And so uh, what strategies have you used, if any, to handle the other family members? Because it sounds like uh, these other eyes are looking at you. And have you found ways to deflect that? Yeah, I have a very supportive husband. Um, and just leaning into that and asking for support. Um, I think ways, I, I think just leaning into who I want to be and who I am and my values. Um, and having a daughter is also a way that I am able to um, find support. She's like, I want to model for her uh, how to live fully and authentically. And so mm -hmm. that's my motivation too, no matter how difficult it gets. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so how would you state your, the, the goal that you want? Do you want to be guilt free uh, or do you want to be able to do your job in a different way? What is the most important part of the conversation for you? I guess I just want to, I don't know if the guilt will ever go away. I think that's what I hear a lot is that the guilt, yeah. it doesn't ever necessarily leave, but I think it's something that you, like you see the fruits of later on. Yes. Um, because I, I think when I read articles, Googling things about parenthood and motherhood, it, like it's hard now. You don't really you feel afraid that you're like neglecting your child. But then when they grow up and they say that like you living out your, your purpose, your God given purpose and you being happy and joyful and content with life, it gives them a healthy model for themselves. And they thank you for that eventually. <laughs> so <laughs> I just kind of lean into that, that hope that, um, while it's challenging and balancing everything is hard, um, I know that I would not be my happy self, my full self, if I did not follow God's call in my life outside of my home. Yes, yes. Okay, so let me take off my coaching hat a minute and put on um, the old crone hat. Okay. The, the, and the old crone hat says that, yes, they do thank you later. And yes, the guilt isn't going to go and that you 
um, I'd like to cross over into spiritual practice. Mm -hmm. So what kind of spiritual practices do you use when you're in that place of just feeling kind of, kind of burdened by the guilt of it? Um, definitely a lot of prayer, lots of singing, um, connected with God through music. Um, I actually think exercise is a spiritual practice for me. Um, so I, I joined Orange Theory Fitness recently, um, and that has really been a space for myself and community because it's a community, a communal practice. Um, so just taking care of my body and my spirit, all of those things integrated is, is I think it's what really nurtures my spirit. I think you've got a really good handle on, uh, on self-care. And do you have a chance to gather with other moms of uh, young, young uh, babies like you have? Not really, honestly. I feel I'm not I, trying to torture you because no. I know it's like to have a seven month old. <laughs> no, this is a great question because I actually feel kind of alone as a not alone. I do have some friends who have um, children, but majority of my friends, my closest friends, I'm the only one of the only moms. Okay. So it's just like yeah, so I, I do kind of feel <laughs> a little yeah. bit alone, a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Now, are there any ways that um, you could think of that you would be able to connect with people that don't require a face-to-face -face meeting because you don't have that kind of time? Yeah, I, I have some Facebook groups that I could join um, mm -hmm. that have like new moms from my college experience. They created mm -hmm. a Facebook for that. Um, and that's been very helpful. It's just, every, with everything that's going on, I don't really have time to contribute to that Facebook yes. or read the content. So, but if it's important to me, then I have to make time for it, honestly. Okay, so would you be happy with those kind of encounters, Facebook encounters, uh, if you were just a reader a looker and not a poster a participant definitely that's kind of what i do now go back and read the okay threads. okay all righty all right because of the time i'm going to stop now but thank you so much for sharing oh, thank you okay and um here's what i want to explain to the group uh and some of this is just my age in this business Sometimes I'm a coach and sometimes I am a consultant. That is to say, I volunteer what, um, what my experience is or in fact, what maybe some of the facts are if you don't have them. Uh, I feel strongly that if your client comes to you and they don't know the answer and you know that they don't have the answer, why should you hold out on them when you actually do have an answer to give them? All right, it just seems kind of cruel. And I don't believe that it takes away from the practice. But certainly, as you saw in the questioning, the questioning was to draw out her current experience, what kind of things she tried, what kind of things were satisfying to her. And frankly, Reverend LaThelma, I think you've covered all the bases and you are doing fabulously for a mother of a seven month old because I was still mad at seven <laughs> when the baby was seven months old <laughs> that I had to give up my time. <laughs> and because it's a really, really hard transition. Uh, and the other part is that I felt the need to come along to encourage because being a, the mom of a baby is a really tough thing. And one of the ways that a coach works is as the champion of the client, because you have a very supportive system, but some people are in systems where they don't have anybody. Everybody's breathing down their neck. They are spewing invectives at them. They, they're saying that they're doing everything wrong. So at least you have, at, at least you have that. The other part is, Sometimes you have to check reality, which is why I asked the question about um, uh, have you explored any ways other than meeting face-to-face -face because you don't have time, and yes, you said Facebook groups. 
And I could sense that there wasn't a, a, a great amount of satisfaction in that because you'd like to be able to function in that group in a different way. And so sometimes the issue is not um, that things are horrible, but that you have greater expectations than at the moment that the situation can give you. Okay, so there isn't any reason for me to suggest this, 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 and this. I know how much time uh, a mom of a seven month old has and you don't have that much time. I, and I think that you're using it magnificently. And so this is one of the ways, this is one of the ways that um, uh, a coach functions. It is one of my specialties, transition, because life is about change. There isn't anybody alive who hasn't been through a change from the day they're born, when they were on the inside, now they're on the outside, and all the things that go along with that. And so coaching is a modality that helps you to um, traverse those transitions. And some of those transitions are tough. Moving to other states, moving to other homes, going to college, it can be anything where things were one way one minute and they're another way the next minute. They're familiar one minute, and they're unfamiliar the next minute. And as all, probably all of you on the line know, at any given moment, things can change instantly. And then you're thrown into that. And so I'd like to know now if anybody has any questions. Yes, any questions? You can type them or raise your hand and I can allow you to talk. Okay, we have Kathy. All right. Uh, Kathy, you can speak now if you want. Um, I'm just curious. You said um, that um, if the, the person that you're coaching um, doesn't know the answer and you know they don't know the answer, you should just give them the answer. Um, I almost felt like that was enabling. And when do you know that you shouldn't en um, enable the um, person by giving them the answer or um, help them along, if that makes sense? <laughs> okay, yes, that makes total sense. Okay, some of this is, um, some of this is uh, prayer, the Holy Spirit, some may call it intuition, uh, mm -hmm. at, because I can often sense when people are kind of at the end of their rope with what they know and what they've experienced. And if we don't settle that issue, we can't go to the next step because they will still be thinking about that as unfinished business. Okay. And so that's how I can tell. And, and also in the course of a conversation with uh, people where you've got several meetings, I can usually tell when people are in an enabling kind of situation. Now, because of my advanced age, I have many clients who come to me who are younger, which only means that my experience base may be, may be wider in some ways. And so that is when I would step in. Now, if we had another kind of situation with which I were not familiar, I might go down um, a different line of, of questioning. Okay. But in this particular case, I just trusted the process and it was helpful to uh, say, here's what I would have done. Okay. I hope that helps. Yes, thank you. All right. Any more questions? Well, Elaine, while we wait for people to have more questions, do you wanna share um, a little bit about benefits of coaching while people- um, Yeah. Yes, yes, um, uh, some of the benefits of coaching, and this will be on a handout that uh, Reverend LaFelma is going to provide later to all of you who are on the call, but some of the benefits of, of coaching are clarity regarding the goal that you're trying to achieve. Sometimes it's not about uh, absolutely knowing uh, what's going to happen, but having clarity about your mindset about the attitude. Because have you ever been in a situation where you really had an inkling that you weren't going to like it or you, maybe you shouldn't even do it? And that answer that's no is as good as the yes answer when you understand why, why it is 
or for instance, I have a friend who just took a new job, which is very time consuming. Um, and uh, he always thought that he would like that opportunity. And today he said, I won't do it again. And that, came, the, and that clarity came from being in the moment because there was nothing like the experience, but some of what he's experiencing could have been addressed by some coaching questions. And I wasn't privy to do that. Uh, some coaching questions that would have revealed, wow, there's really going to be a uh, drain on your time, those kinds of things. Okay, another benefit of case, coaching is acceleration toward change. I just wanna say here that change and transition aren't the same because people use them interchangeably, but change is an event and transition is a process. So for instance, I've moved several times and each time my mind was just blown because I had to leave uh, family and friends. So getting to the new house was not the issue. And that was the change. But the transition was my mindset about being in this new place with people I didn't know, people I didn't know if I was going to like, an environment I didn't know if I was going to like. And so my mindset had to catch up with the reality of it. And so those are the differences between change and transition. So uh, coaching helps you to really get in touch with those things. Coaching can be a catalyst for spiritual transformation because many times people are talking about things that uh, not affect their, their lives in a very spiritual way, relationships that they have with their family, sometimes relationships they have with God, understand what their spiritual gifts are. And coaching can be a catalyst for that. Or knowing whether or not you ought to step into the next thing that God is saying, mm, get moving, get moving. And you can, uh, um, you can be coached toward those. Uh, expanded thinking about a particular issue where sometimes you go, wow, I never even thought of it that way. And so coaching is very good for that. Uh, there are, I, you can identify mindsets that can hinder you from reaching your goals because there are several things in my life that I haven't done and I wish I'd had a coach. And by the way, I do have a coach. Even coaches have coaches. And I have a coach whom I meet with every week. And so also, and, and lastly, but it's not the last thing, there are a ton of things. Um, it's a partnership in making your goals happen. And feeling that you're not alone is a big thing, especially if you do very sol solitary work, um, that you have somebody who's in your corner, who is encouraging you, who's challenging you, who's really kind of giving that little nudge, come on, yeah, you can do it kind of thing. And so those are just some of the benefits of coaching. Wonderful. Are there any other questions? I had a question about, because you identified the different types of the varieties of spiritual companionship. Um, do you suggest that people do them one at a time? Like if you if you are more in the pastoral counseling or therapy phase, is, are there phases? like? Do you have to like be, is there like an arri a, a place of arrival for therapy and then you can go to life coaching? I'm just kind of like, where? sometimes I feel like I need to, to go to therapy. And then like, sometimes I feel like I need some life coaching too. Like, do these things happen simultaneously or are they in stages, do you think? Well, my experience says that they can happen simultaneously. And here's an example. A woman came for me to coaching and we were in a retreat setting. So it was kind of in deep. Uh, for like 10, 15 minutes, and then we move on. So we got deep very, and very much, um, and very much in a hurry. And she was, had just retired from a teaching career, which she adored. She'd been in it for 35 years, and it quickly became clear to me that she was grieving the loss of a job, which is only natural. And so I'm saying, God, should I say it or shouldn't I? And so I said, I think you need a grief counselor. And she started crying. And I, I, I was actually relieved. But what that said was that this was a really big loss to her. And she knew the future was bright, but she couldn't get past that point. And so I know a grief counselor could do what she needed to have done. 
And so I said to her, I really think it would help you if you had a chance to just lay out all the issues with a, a, a grief counselor who is used to nailing what the issues are. And after um, the sessions, when you think that it's over, then you can come for coaching. Because when people come for coaching, they are reasonably uh, mentally and spiritually healthy, where therapists really deal with that place where you're really kind of stuck and you can't get past those, those mental issues. So it depends is, is the answer to that question. So do you have any advice for people um, who may be discerning what stage they are in their lives? Because it sounded like for that person, you were able to identify their need, but what, you know, what if they, what if you run into a life coach who's like, who won't be able to identify that or is less inclined to? So are there tips like internal reflections that you can have with yourself to determine okay this situation is a therapy type of situation this situation is a mentoring type of situation or yes, yes. discipling how how can we as people seeking support how can we discern that for us well i think what you can do is if you um look at a chart like this you can kind of gauge where you are and then i think you should rely on the people who know you best uh, that person may be a pastor, that person may be a best friend. You know, I've said to friends of mine, do you think I'm hanging on to this issue for too long? It's been fill in the blank, five years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, at that point where I think I can't move forward and I can't get over it, I check in the therapy. And I've checked into therapy before. I know people who are therapists and coaches. And uh, they were usually therapists first. Uh, and what they say to their uh, clients is, just let me put on my coaching hat for a minute so that they have a chance to answer the questions because therapists do a lot of listening and they do a lot of giving you information on, on how to move forward. Because a coach really believes that deep within you, you really have an opinion about things and they're driven by certain values and sometimes you don't even know that they're at work. That's so true. Let's see. Any other questions? No. I think people. I think for a lot of us, this is a new, a new um, terrain. Yes. Um, thinking about life coaching and when we're ready for life coaching or. Um, I'm sure people's minds are just like trying to wrap, they're trying to wrap their heads around. Yes, um, yes. And, and, I, and I'd like to make the, the comment that I think that uh, the issue about double-mindedness that's mentioned in the Bible is so powerful because double-mindedness spills out into every area of your life, which is why the scriptures say a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Well, I used to read that and go, who are you talking to? <laughs> that is really mean. But the truth of it is, many of us sit up late at night, mulling things over and over and over, worrying that we can't move forward, worrying about what's gonna happen if we do move forward, worrying about all the things that are affecting the way you think because these are the things that went down before. And so coaching can be one of those things that helps you to get unstuck and really empower you to be able to kind of get out of your own way. So it is just, it's one of, it's one of many things. And the first thing I would say is pray. You know, if you ask God, I need somebody, that person will show up and then rely on your closest inner circle to uh, tell them what the situation is and ask them what they think. And now that you know what life coaching is, maybe it will fit in as a way for you to move forward. That's right. I just wanted to ask our attendees. Oh, Gail, uh, someone had a question. How would one find a coach? Is it likely to be expensive? Um, the piece about expensive, it depends on who you are and what you want to spend. And there are all kinds of coaches from 
free coaches on some coaching marketplaces, the coaches that charge thousands of dollars in a month. Uh, so that would be on you to find, but how you can you find a coach will be on the fact sheet that you're going to send to people because the International Coaching Federation does keep a website and there are coaches that are listed by category. Um, there is, um, the school that I went to was the um, International Life uh, Coach Training, which had a Christian track. Uh, they keep the files on people who are coaching. But if you plug in uh, to Google, you're looking for a life coach, the names will be flying. And so, and you would treat that person like any other professional um, and ask them questions, ask them about their experience, ask them about their schooling, uh, ask them how long they've been coaching, ask them who their primary uh, people are that they, that they coach. Um, and um, you should be able to come to a decision and certainly interview several people before you make a decision. So you'll have that information in front of you so that you'll be able to um, look for a coach effectively. Yeah, I will send that out in our post, our follow-up email. Yeah. I was wondering if anyone was, would be willing to share why they chose to attend this webinar. What about life coaching interest? Why did it interest you? Um, just if anybody's willing to kind of share and talk about that and maybe a question can emerge from that. And I can, if you raise your hand, I can, okay, we have some money. All right, hold on, there you go. All right, go ahead. Hi, Reverend Lagama, this is Hello. Reverend Grace. Hi, Reverend Grace. Hey. So I'm really enjoying this. I've um, never been to um, um, a life coaching, uh, and, but basically I, I've realized now that I have been a life coach because I do <laughs> do pastor, pastoral counseling and, and um, grief counseling, and I'm, I have gone through grief myself, but I basically just wanted to just comment on your, um, Reverend Lathelma, your comments or statements about guilt and motherhood, and I think that um, We've all been there, especially me, but I find that um, um, as life goes on and the children grow up, that they learn from example mm -hmm. in terms of um, hard work and what it achieves. Because if we don't have the luxury of being homemakers and we have to get out and provide for the family, I, from experience, have found that just modeling a good work ethic. So if we have to get out and work, I find that being a good model for work ethic is about the best thing we can do to help alleviate the guilt. So if we are going to go out and work outside the home, uh, model for the child. Don't let the child see you constantly calling sick um <laughs> be if you're gonna get outside the house and work be a good worker go to work just about every day that you can yes. and um and 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 show them that hard work and the lifestyle that you're living if we can provide a good middle class um environment for them nice home nice neighborhood um we're not you know if you're not uh, not the rich but just nice just show them that a good work ethic is good and i know that at the end of the day when they're grown that that guilt will eventually subside because when we see the fruits of our labor manifested in our children, and then they become good workers in their workplace while they're getting their education, then you will see at the end of the day that it will be worth it. So I just pray that um, your guilt be by just having a good work ethic and say, okay, little baby, you are gonna have a good hard working model here, and you're gonna see that 
this is what it takes to be able to raise you and provide the best for you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much, Reverend Grace. That's very helpful um, to hear, to know that it's true. It's a, and, a, uh, and I'll just comment, although this is not a, a counseling session, right. I'll just comment. I had a friend who carried a lot of guilt because she loved to go to work. Mm. She loved what she did. And she was in a religious community that did not feel good about women going to work. So she told very few people. People knew that she wasn't around, but they kind of couldn't figure out why. And uh, so there's always something, I think, for women. There's always something that, that we're grappling with because society has set so many parameters for us about which we feel guilty. Right. And you're just trying to do your best. Right. How do you, how do you, I just wanted to highlight one attendee's comment. They said, hello, I was interested in learning what life coaching is. Thank you for providing this webinar. It truly seems that serving as a life coach is one way to share God's love. Yes. That's it. It truly is a way to share God's love. Um, and I'm just wondering, how do you, in your coaching sessions, how do you help um, coaches kind of understand like society and society's influences uh, on their goals right because you can have so much will and desire to achieve yes. goal, but then there's these outside forces that may hinder yes. your progress how how do you help people coach through like those issues those systemic things that may be happening outside and yes. that's hindering them from achieving their goals well i don't approach that uh, like a therapist, that is to say, that's not my primary goal to point out to them that there are these set systemic things, but rather through my questioning to help them to understand the forces that are at work. For instance, many times people don't do things because of fear. And I run down a, a series of questions about, um, about why they're not doing certain things, uh, how they approach certain things. And then my comment would be after they've explored it, but usually the lights come on by then. Well, but you know what? I think I'm the one holding myself back. Mm -hmm. Where a therapist would say up front, I see fear, here's what you should do. Where a life coach would ask the questions and allow the, the client to be able to put those things together. If they don't put them together, but I feel like I've done the exploring, then I'd say, this sounds like there's a lot of fear driving this. So because a client should be really, um, be the one revealing what's going on. Okay. And if it looks like it's really devastating and it's beyond anything I know that uh, a life coach can do, then perhaps some, some kind of pastoral counseling or therapies in order. I haven't had to say that uh, too often because coaches are usually uh, portrayed as very happy and up people. So you don't get a lot of pathologies and uh, neurosis from, from your clients. I see. Thank you. Anybody else want to share um, why they're on? And well, we have a few more minutes, so. Okay, and so right here is it. This is where I can tell them that um, I've got a gift of a worksheet for them. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I do, and I'm very excited about it. Um, it is called Breaking Through the Clarity in 20 Minutes. So if you spend five minutes each on the question, you put in the situation or the um, space where you need to make a decision or at least move forward on a decision and answer those questions. And it should help you move your mindset along toward what you should possibly do. But the other parts about creating a strategy and the steps and putting those things in place and the partners, well, that's the story of a coaching session but at least you will have that in front of you and I, I bet you'll find it uh, pretty freeing. Uh, and if, do you have my uh, information? If you contact me through my uh, email address, then I will be happy to send that to you 
or if you can message me through my Facebook page, you'll find I only have a Facebook page because my website is totally under construction because it deconstructed. Uh, but I'm in the process of rebuilding that. But you can do that or take my number down and uh, you can give me a call. Uh, and I believe someone asked about being a coach uh, on the fact sheet that uh, is going to be sent out to you is the information about becoming a coach, both a Christian coach, because now there are plenty of places where you can become uh, a coach that has a Christian worldview. Uh, I was glad to have dual training if you're thinking about this. We used a book that was um, written as a regular text, and then we added on the Christian worldview because our clients are very interested in a biblical worldview when they come for coaching. But I know what the rest of the world says about coaching, so it makes it, uh, it, makes it easy to know. All right. I don't think we have any more questions. Thank you for your time. I'm sorry yes. I can't see all of you. <laughs> Please remember, thank you so much to Elaine for sharing about life coaching um, and just really in uh, educating us on the variety of, of offerings that um, we can have for our spiritual growth. And oh, we have something happening here. We have a chat. She says, thank you. You're oh, welcome. Thank you. Wonderful. Awesome. So um, thank you all so much for joining us. And I think uh, let me make sure we don't have another question. We have something open here. Okay, someone said, as an adult instructor, I had a chair in my class that became a life coach chair. People wanted to discuss all of their personal thoughts with me instead of classroom work. This is definitely needed. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> it is. Just from my short little coaching session, I was like, I need to do this. <laughs> Seriously. Well, ladies, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, please take the survey so that we can continue providing you with outstanding webinars and know that you have a community of sisters who seek, who are all seeking wholeness together and we want to see you whole. So have a great night and we'll be in touch. If you have any questions, you feel free to email Elaine and you will also get all these resources that she mentioned in a follow-up email. Thank you, Elaine, again and good night to everyone. Thank you.